Casual Birder Podcast, a weekly podcast for people interested in wild birds. I'm Susie Buttress. I've recently had some wonderful sightings of rooks at home and ravens in Banff, Alberta. This week, I described the many members of the Corvid family that I've been lucky enough to see. Also, we'll hear listeners' results from the RSPB's Big Garden Bird Watch. During my regular weekend garden bird watches for the British Trust for Ornithology, I've been noticing some interesting behaviours from the rooks visiting my garden, and between the rooks and other members of the Corvid family. I also had some wonderful close views of ravens and black-billed magpies while in Banff at Christmas. I'll share these observations a little later in the show, but while reviewing these experiences, I realised that I find a lot of pleasure in just watching crows and their relatives. They seem to be such characterful birds. In this episode, I'll introduce some of the members of the Corvid family that are found in the UK and in North America, and we'll revisit each of them in greater depth in future episodes. First, a little bit of science. Living organisms are classified in a very structured way, according to characteristics or adaptations that define them. The process starts with a grouping that defines the most creatures, such as animals, and then narrows down group by group, until we get to a group that defines a specific animal. A two-part scientific name, also known as a Latin name, is given to each animal to indicate where they sit in the classification. The first word is the generic name, and tells what genus an animal belongs to. And the second word is the specific name, which identifies the species. There are subspecies as well, but for the purposes of this show, family, genus and species are sufficient to describe the birds I talk about. So, the corvid family, known more colloquially in English as the crow family, contains the crows, jays and magpies of the world. The genus containing the most species in this family is Corvus, and it includes the American crow, carrion crow, hooded crow, common or northern raven and rook, and these birds all have Corvus as the first part of their scientific name. Also in the Corvid family, but in different genera, they have different first words for their scientific name, and they might be thought of as cousins to the crows, are Eurasian magpies and black-billed magpies, European jays, Blue Jays, Stella's Jay and Jackdaw. In the UK there are eight birds of the Corvid family that you might expect to see depending on your location. Ravens, Rooks, Carrion Crows, Hooded Crows, Jackdaws, Magpies, Jays and Chuffs. Ravens, Rooks and Carrion Crows have the common feature of generally being large black birds with black or grey bills that are distinctively crow-shaped a sturdy bill, upright, confident stance and a tendency to walk slowly as though they're taking inventory or inspecting their surroundings. They may also hop or jump. The common or northern raven is our largest corvid. They are bigger even than the common buzzard. Their plumage is all black with a purple sheen that can be seen in sunlight. They have very thick, sturdy beaks and have an unmistakable call which sounds like a deep crack or even a snort. Once, on the Isle of Skye, I thought I could hear pigs on a distant farm grunting at each other until I realised that it was ravens calling. In the UK, they are found in the west and the north in unpopulated areas, usually uplands and coasts, and are generally wary and shy of people. A small group of them live at the Tower of London. I've only seen ravens in the UK in clifftop locations, And usually it's their call that attracts my attention. Often there are only one or two birds flying together. But in the Alps I've seen seven or eight coming together, to mob an eagle for example. This same species is the one that I saw most recently while in Canada, in Banff, Alberta. There this bird is much more plentiful and certainly more tolerant of humans. It's quite normal to see them there in the towns or around habitation And because they are more prevalent, it's much easier to hear them making all their various calls and noises, including rattles and clicks of their beak. In flight, they can be seen to have diamond or wedge-shaped tails. They can also be very acrobatic, 
often tumbling or rolling in the air. I remember the one I saw last June on my way up to Lake Arrowhead in California. I'm almost at Lake Arrowhead, uh, just a few miles away, and I've stopped in a turnout just to have a look over the canyon um, and just look around and see if I could see any birds. And there was a raven flying overhead. I wasn't absolutely sure at first whether it was a raven or a crow. The tail did look like it fanned um, in a sort of raven style. So ravens have a diamond-shaped tail rather than a um, square-cut tail. And this definitely had a diamondy look, but then he kept fanning it out and it then looked more like a crow tail. But, and, but it looked quite large. So I was erring towards it being a raven, but not wanting to assume and it wasn't making any noise. And then all of a sudden, as it was soaring around overhead, it did two barrel rolls. So it pulled its wings right in close to its body and then just did a complete 360 turn as it lost altitude. Um, just absolutely stunning. And as it did it, it did a really strong croak and I knew straight away it was definitely a raven. It's surprising to see a bird turn upside down in the air. Rooks are well known as a raucous social bird that roosts in large colonies. They are found all over the UK except in the north and west of Scotland. They're mainly a bird of rural areas or town parks and steer clear of cities. They're often seen in large flocks roaming through farm fields, foraging for grubs and earthworms and accompanied by jackdaws. Rooks are rarely seen alone. They have black plumage with bare grey skin around their beaks, which makes it look like they have a whitish face. The formidable looking beak is also greyish. In sunlight, a purplish or green sheen can be seen on their plumage. While their call is raucous, you may sometimes be lucky and hear the other noises that they make. Carrion crows are most usually found alone or in pairs, although they may roost communally in the winter. Bigger than a wood pigeon, and more slender, they are found in England and Wales and are recognisable with their all-black plumage. They often call in short bursts. In flight, they have a fan-shaped tail, and this, along with their smaller size, is the easiest way to tell from ravens. Crows are found in both rural and urban areas. In fact, I learned last summer that the juvenile rooks I thought I had seen in Regent's Park were actually juvenile carrion crows and that rooks are not found in cities at all. While they may become tolerant of people, the ones in my neighbourhood are very wary. If I happen to see one in the garden and they notice even a tiny movement from me through the window, they fly away. While the previously described birds are familiar to most people as large, all-black birds with a raucous call, did you know that other members of the corvid family found in the UK have more varied features? These are the hooded crows, jackdaws, magpies, jays and chuffs. Hooded crows are very similar to carrion crows but have mainly grey bodies with black head and bib, black wings and tail. They are found in Scotland and Ireland while carrion crows are found in the rest of the UK. As they're so similar to carrion crows, for many years they were thought to be a geographical variation of that species. But since 2002, they've been described as a separate species. Here's a recording of hooded crows made last year on the Scottish island of Egg. Jackdaws are one of my favourite members of the crow family. They are smaller than the rooks with which they often congregate. They have a black plumage, but with their silver-grey nape, black cap and pale grey-blue eyes, they really are handsome birds. Their call sounds petulant to me, like they're upset things aren't going their way. Eurasian magpies appear white and black from a distance, but close up it's possible to see green, blue and purple iridescence in their wing and tail feathers. Speaking of the tail, it's very long, just as long as the body of the bird itself. 
Magpies have harsh calls and can be raucous when threats are near. They're disliked by some people as their confidence can appear aggressive and they are known to kill smaller birds and eat eggs and nestlings, which is something other corvids do as well. However, they're incredibly curious about their environment and they can be mischievous, as I noticed last year when I watched three youngsters repeatedly pulling the clothes pegs off my washing. In the UK, we have the Eurasian magpie, Pika Pika, and in Banff, I saw the identical-looking black-billed magpie, Pika Hudsonia. When I returned home, I looked into these two birds further to try to understand why they were classified as different species, because they looked exactly the same. It appears that while outwardly identical, studies of the DNA of these two birds have placed them as different species. Eurasian jays are the most colourful member of the crow family found in the UK, with a mainly peach-coloured body, black tail and wings, and a blue patch on the front edge of the wing. They also have a white throat and prominent white rump. The Eurasian jay is the most secretive of the crows, and that white rump is mostly what you see as the jay is flying away from you. However, they have a very raucous call, which they are not secretive about sharing at all. You can find a more detailed description of this jay, including its North American cousins, the Blue Jay and Stella's Jay, in my episode with Jessica Delisle. The link is in the show notes. The eighth member of the crow family found in the UK is the chuff. They are a more distant cousin of the crows, confined to the extreme western coasts, such as Pembrokeshire and Cornwall. They have black plumage, red legs and thin, red, down-curved beaks, which they use to dig for invertebrates. Their calls are much higher pitched than crows and ravens. They're also found on the county coat of arms for Cornwall and are linked to the legend of King Arthur. All corvids are intelligent, have problem-solving abilities and are known to use tools. They're also able to mimic other sounds, for example, human voices. Due to their black plumage and curiosity or interest in observing humans, crows and ravens are birds that excite creepy feelings and are found heavily represented in folklore and mythology, usually with the implication of being a deceiver or being cleverer than the other animals or humans mentioned. Often thought of as sinister, the collective noun for crows is a murder and for ravens is a conspiracy. There are popular superstitions about the crow family. If crows are seen sitting on the roof of a house, it's said that a death will soon occur. There are tales of crows and magpies having favourite humans and of bringing shiny gifts to the ones that they favour. And according to legend, if ravens are removed from the Tower of London, the Kingdom of England will fall. Then there is the nursery rhyme about magpies that suggests the number of magpies' scenes foretells the future. One for sorrow, two for joy, three for a girl, four for a boy, and so on. The raven is a key character in the oral tradition of the First Nations of British Columbia, depicted as both a creator and a trickster, and may be seen represented in their art. And, of course, there is Edgar Allan Poe's famous work, The Raven. I remember as a child reading Aesop's fables and finding that crows are resourceful and can outwit other animals. In one story, The Crow and the Pitcher, a thirsty crow comes across a water pitcher with the water level too low for the crow to reach with its beak. It drops some pebbles into the water to raise the water level and is finally able to drink. The moral of that story is that necessity is the mother of invention. But I find it intriguing that this story was created so long ago and in recent years, experimental trials with crows have found that they exhibited this same problem-solving behaviour without training to obtain food from a test tube of water. So, back to my garden. During the bird count a few weeks ago, a magpie, two rooks and a carrion crow visited About 10 minutes before the count was due to start, I replenished my two sunflower seed feeders and threw some sunflower seeds onto the ground feeding trays. I also scattered some suet pellets around the garden. As soon as I got back to my window to begin the count, a rook was already in the garden, eating from the coconut with suet in. 
In order to get to the suet, it had to slide down one of the arms of the feeder station. A most uncomfortable looking posture, especially as to balance, it needed to keep flapping one of its wings. As I watched, a second rook flew in and started eating the pellets on the ground, a much easier way to feed. From nowhere, it seemed, a magpie steamed into the garden, landed and straight away started to eat and gather all the pellets that it could. It darted around the lawn finding each pellet and being careful to avoid the rook and it quickly flew off, I imagine, to cache the pellets and store them for later. The rook on the coconut seemed to recognise that there was more interesting food on the ground and rather than balance precariously trying to get suet from the hanging feeder, It moved to start strutting around the lawn, picking up the pellets as it went. The magpie returned, or maybe a second one did, but it went straight for the pellets, so it clearly knew they were there. It barely stopped to check its surroundings before grabbing the pellets, moving with quick jumps and sideways grabs to steal the pellets out from in front of the rook. I marvelled at their differing manner, the rook, so sure of itself, walking steadily around and picking up the pellets confident with its bigger size and formidable beak, and the magpie, knowing it was ill-matched in size against the rook, despite also having a big pointed beak, but relying on speed and audacity to gain a share of easy food. Suddenly, both rooks and the magpie were spooked and flew away. A carrion crow swept through the airspace over my garden, clearly checking out the food opportunities and frightening off the opposition. But it didn't stay. They are as skittish as the jays in my area and very rarely do I see them on the ground in my garden. I still haven't worked out why carrion crows are so disliked by all of the other garden birds. But anyway, that was the end of my corvid watching that day and gradually the smaller birds came into the garden to feed. Corvids were also the bird family I saw most often during my recent visit to Banff, Alberta. Winter is not the best time for bird watching in Banff but our primary reason for going there was so my husband could ski. As I don't enjoy skiing, I always use these vacations to take notes of the birds I can find and go on bird walks. Luckily, our accommodation had a deck overlooking a wooded hillside, so I was able to spend time at the window, looking over the trees to the mountain opposite when the weather was bad, and going for winter walks when the weather was good. As we had arrived during darkness, I was keen to see what the first birds I would see would be. On that first morning, we went out for breakfast something that seems so natural on vacation and yet we rarely do at home. And I saw three or four magpies in the car park in town. I logged them, then almost ignored them, until I remembered that no matter how much they looked like the magpies back home, these were black-billed magpies, a different species. I had a couple of opportunities to watch the magpies further during my stay. They behaved exactly like the ones I was so used to at home, foraging by turning the leaf litter over with their beaks, opportunistically grabbing a dropped burger roll and holding it with a foot while tearing chunks off, burying food under the snow to cache it for later. They sounded very similar too, although the call was just a bit off. I couldn't exactly say why, but I knew it wasn't the magpie call from back home. It was like it had a different accent. The bird I was most excited about seeing was the raven. We've seen ravens many times when we've been in America or Canada, and I'm always awed by them. There were ravens around the accommodation where we were staying and it was quite common to hear their calls. When I went for walks, I would stand and watch them while they foraged for food. On my last day in Banff, I went for a walk along the Hoodoo Trail near Tunnel Mountain. I was walking alone and contemplating walking to the furthest lookout point when a raven called out continuously and landed in a tree in front of me. It called and snapped its beak many times. I knew that it was calling to other birds, but I got spooked by it. Being alone in the woods, knowing that I had seen a coyote in the area just a couple of days before, I started to wonder if it was giving me a warning about something ahead. My logical mind knew this wasn't the case, but I was alone, on a trail in the woods, in an unfamiliar location, in the freezing cold. A raven, the bird that features in so many myths and tales, was calling out insistently. I thought about the irony of a bird warning me to turn back and me ignoring it. So I listened and turned back. The big 
garden bird watch took place on the last weekend of January. I saw nine species in my garden during the count. One blackbird, two blue tits, three chaffinches, a dunnock, three house sparrows, a magpie, one robin, four rooks and five wood pigeons. Those were quite unusual numbers for the rooks. Other listeners shared what they'd seen. Ewan, the Edinburgh bird watcher, saw three robins, one great spotted woodpecker, one feral pigeon, seven blue tits, seven coal tits, four great tits and five wood pigeons. Now, although Ewan had the same number of wood pigeons as me, I've never seen seven coal tits together. That was amazing. And I did wonder whether the coal tits and the blue tits were possibly travelling together as a large group for the winter. And David Fallow saw ten goldfinches, three blue tits, one coal tit, seven starlings, two robins, twelve house sparrows, two dunnock and four chaffinches. The twelve house sparrows was fantastic, but the ten goldfinches was really amazing. That was a real charm of goldfinches. We've had some snow over the past few days here, and this brought a brand new garden visitor, a red wing. Well, three red wings, in fact. They sat in the tree for a few minutes, and although they didn't come down to eat, as I hoped, I was able to get some photographs, which I've shared in all the usual places. This now takes my garden bird list for 2019 up to 20. They are blackbird, red wing, blue tit, great tit, long tail tip, house sparrow, chaffinch, goldfinch, greenfinch, robin, dunnock, black cap, starling, rook, carrion crow, magpie, jackdaw, collared dove, wood pigeon and the red-legged partridge. There aren't many more birds that we're likely to get in the garden, possibly another five with summer visitors, but I'll keep you posted about any I see. It is interesting how with one month gone, we've already seen the vast majority of birds that we're likely to see this year in the garden. Has anyone else been keeping a year list for their garden? Do let me know how 2019 is turning out for you. Join our Facebook group to discuss this week's episode or post your photos of the birds you've seen. I really do enjoy hearing your tales, so come and join the conversation there. Find us at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash casual birder podcast. Follow me on Twitter at casual birder pod or on Instagram at casual birder podcast. And you can email me at casual pod at gmail.com. Make sure you don't miss any episodes by subscribing to the show. Subscribing is free and you can do it wherever you listen. If you enjoy the show, please consider posting about it on social media. Personal recommendation is such a valuable way of helping others to listen. Thank you to Randy Braun for designing the artwork for the show. The theme music is Short Sleeve Shirt by The Drones. Thanks to them for letting me use it. Check out their website at www.dronesmusic.net. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you'll join me again for another episode of The Casual Birder Podcast.